Hello students, this is a fiction crash course designed for my English 312 students in the fall of 2021. This is going to cover the basics of writing a traditional short story. Most of the things that I say here hold true for all fiction, but you can definitely break these rules if you see fit, and there are plenty of pieces of fiction that don't follow these rules, or don't follow some of them. Conflict is the heart of fiction. It is at least the heart of most fiction, and certainly most traditional fiction. And that conflict arises because your characters are going to want things. Tangible things like a new car, or intangible things like romance or friendship. Something is going to stop your characters from getting those things easily. So if a character wants a new car, maybe they don't have enough money, or maybe their uh, spouse is telling them they can't spend money on a new car when they have a child on the way, or they can, should spend the money on something else. Or maybe they want romance, but the people that they want romance from aren't interested in them or don't know them yet. Something is getting in the way, and that is where this conflict arises, and this tension between wanting something and not being able to get it easily is what drives fiction. These points, again, are true of most fiction, but not all. You will find some very few pieces of fiction where this is not the point of the story. Here we have an example of what a traditional short story might look like. If you think about this as a tension map, as the story moves along, tension rises until it hits a peak or climax, and then tension falls again at the end of the story. The first part of this, where tension is low, is called the exposition. As tension rises, we call that rising action. We have the climax, and then again, falling action. And now we'll talk about each of these parts. The exposition is, as I said, usually low tension. Sometimes you will introduce conflict at the very beginning of a story, in which case you might have periods of high tension already at that point. But generally, what you're doing in the exposition is introducing the characters, or at least the main character, introducing the setting, so you are letting the reader see the world that exists for these people, see the characters inhabit that world, and you're also letting the reader get used to your voice, how you are going to tell the story. Uh, so all of this is going to be important because otherwise your reader will just be plopped into things that are already happening, which can work too, actually. And you shouldn't be afraid of just jumping straight into the action. At least by the end of the exposition, the conflict should appear. And what I mean by that is, by the end of the exposition, your reader should know what your main character or characters want, and it should be clear to us that there is something getting in the way of it, or else the character would have it already. A rising action is where the character is trying to get what they want or keep what they have, and something is getting in the way of that, or something is going to get in the way of that, and the character is trying to avoid that thing. What this often looks like in fiction is a series of struggles, a series of attempts by the character to get what they want or keep what they have, and as the story moves forward, these struggles increase in importance and the tension in the story builds. Often you'll see a character trying to get what they want and failing, or trying to get what they want and getting closer to it. Uh, so maybe if we have a character who wants to buy a new car, but they, they don't have enough money to do that, they will take on another job, or maybe they'll consider selling some of their possessions. And as we move on through the story, maybe the character starts working more and more, 
and they don't have time for other parts of their life so tension is building there are other things pulling on them or if they're selling their possessions maybe they sell bigger and bigger more and more important possessions and lose track of what their life is really about for example this part of the story generally takes up the most space because this is where the character the the character's struggle which is the part that's going to interest the reader the most this is where that happens and that's usually going to take up more space than your exposition where you're just introducing things or the falling action where again which we'll see in a little bit this is how your reader knows what the character's life will be like uh, what the character's life will be like moving forward. The climax is the peak of tension, as you could tell from that tension map earlier. And this is where the character either gets or doesn't get what they want. Often, this is what we'll see in the climax. This is their last chance or the last struggle before things are resolved. In fiction where the character's growth is the main point, so they're learning something and that is what you as an author want the story to be about, the climax may be something that doesn't have anything to do with their actual desire. So in a story where a character wants a new car and they're selling off their possessions and they're get to a point where the last thing that they have left to sell is an heirloom that has been passed on from generation to generation and they are at let's say a pawn shop or an antique dealer and they're about to sell off this very important thing maybe they have a realization then about who they are that can be the climax of your story uh, even though they aren't at the point where they're buying or not buying a new car yet, they are making a realization there, and that can be the climax of your story. And it's important to remember that a story can still be great even if your character fails to get what they want. Stories where people are unsuccessful or characters are unsuccessful can still definitely work. You should not feel compelled to always write stories where your characters succeed. Although, those are good stories too. There are good stories of all kinds. The falling action comes after the climax. It is not always included or not always given a great amount of attention, but if it is, it usually shows how the character reacts to getting or not getting what they want. Uh, it shows us how the character has developed or changed based on this experience. And we get to learn what the character's life will be like from now on. If they learn something, how is that lesson going to change what they do in the future? How is it going to change the way they live? And a character doesn't always have to change, but a satisfying character often will. And remember that unless you're writing a fairy tale, you can't just end a story with happily ever after. Because uh, characters, real characters, want things all the time. Um, there is always something to either want to get or want to keep. If your character ends up happy, they want to keep that happiness. Um, and you know, characters can be happy. But, I don't know, nobody's life is perfect is what I wrote here. That means that, like I said, life is a struggle. But a character is allowed to be happy in the moment. You don't have to make a really big deal out of this. So, as you can probably tell from everything that we just talked about, characters are the driving force in fiction. Their desires create conflict, and that conflict creates tension and that tension is what readers want to have so to make your reader feel invested in this your character's desires should feel real to that reader and that doesn't mean real as in realism you, you don't always have to write realistic fiction but it means real 
as in believable for that character in that situation. A character who lives underwater doesn't need a new car. Why do they want a new car? You can give them a believable reason for wanting a new car. Maybe, uh, maybe they're trying to keep up with their neighbor who lives on land, but you need to give us a reason to believe that this character wants that thing. Your characters usually should be allowed to learn and grow. As they struggle to get what they want, they should adapt to new situations, change their approach, get better at doing what it is that they're doing. Unless they're stubborn, they are set in their ways, or you don't really want the reader to like them, or unless they have always done something one way and you want to make a point of that bullheadedness, I guess this is going back to the stubborn thing, um, and show that this sort of thing doesn't work. And I want to point out that this is true no matter who your main characters are. This going back to the realism question. No matter what kind of characters you're writing, motivation and change are going to make a story feel worthwhile to your reader. Scene and summary are two different ways of writing things that happen in your story. And almost always, important events should come in scene. And scene is... Uh, Scene is vivid writing that is moment to moment or close to that. And I sh should stop here and point out that if you're trying to bury details, like if you're writing a mystery story and you want your reader to have knowledge but not really notice that they have that knowledge, you can bury details in summary, but you can do the same thing in very detailed scene. You can have important things come up that are just a, in a whole mess of detail and your reader's mind will gather all of this and not notice the important thing necessarily. So scene, like I said, is moment to moment. It moves slowly as events occur. And it doesn't have to move very slowly. You can write a scene that only mentions a one detail every 10, 20, 30 seconds, or every minute, depending on what's happening. But scene always has vivid sensory description of some kind. You should give your reader something that appeals to their senses. What your characters see, or what they smell, or what they hear, touch, taste, uh, these things will make a scene come alive for your reader. And what your character is experiencing, the things that are important to them that are happening, those things should be related to your reader in your writing. As tension rises in a story, so each little struggle that comes on the way to the big struggle, and also the big struggle itself. Scene generally slows down as tension rises. There's a phrase, uh, time slowed down, which is kind of a cliche, but this, this is very common in fiction for a couple of reasons. One is that you want the tense moments to feel more real for your reader. You want to bring them into the story more as tension rises. And the other reason is that by stacking details one on top of the other as tension is building, you are pushing back the resolution of that tension, which builds more tension. You're building more anticipation as you do that. So this is a good way to make a reader feel both involved and also more tense as they anticipate what's about to come. Here we have the tension map again. So again as we as we build tension throughout the story and you know each each minor struggle or less major struggle that comes in the rising action can have its own moment of slow motion 
where details are stacked on top of the other. All of this builds up until your climax should be full of detail. Your reader should be able to sense everything that's happening there, or at least sense all of the things that are important to your main character. And I'm going to repeat this, these rules are general rules. You can break them and you know, maybe you should try that in this class. It's a low pressure situation. Um, break rules and see what you can get if you want to. Um, but generally, the more tension in a scene, the more vivid detail you should add. So that's all scene summary where you uh, quickly go through things that happen. This is still very important in fiction. Uh, you don't always have to use it. You could write a story that takes place all in scene, but summary can do a few things. It can give the reader a chance to breathe after you have one of these tense scenes that are full of detail. You need to give the reader time, or you can give the reader time to digest all of that by having some summary. We walked back to the house for five miles. Nobody said anything. That just summarized a five mile walk and it gives your reader a little bit of time where they're not having details jammed into their head. Um, it's also letting the tension dissipate. Uh, if you're writing backstory that doesn't need a full flashback, you aren't going to write an entire scene that happened in your character's past. Uh, maybe Maria and I had been friends since we were five years old. We used to play on the swings at recess. This is backstory of a character's relationship with Maria. Uh, this is summary. Uh, it has a little bit of detail. We used to play on the swings at recess, and maybe your reader can imagine doing that, but I haven't spent any time detailing you know, the scuffs on my shoes from kicking the rocks underneath the swings or the creak of the chains, things that would make that into a full scene. You can also use summary to compress space or time. I believe I have an example here. Jumobi drove to the store and got the flour she needed for the cake. So I've just covered, who knows, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of time, depending on how far the store is, in one sentence. And when you're writing summary like this, it's important to figure out what your reader needs to know and also figure out what you need to have happen on that. So in this situation, we need to know that Jumobi went to get the flower that she needed, but nothing else of importance happens at the store or on the drive. Um, and that's fine. Maybe we just needed to get Jumobi out of the house some, so something else could happen there. Or maybe the fact that the flower is missing was important because someone else used the flower beforehand. Who knows? But now Jumobi has the flower. So when you're editing for scene and summary, thinking about the effect that all of this information is going to have on the reader is important. You get to manipulate what the reader knows about your characters and knows about the story. You get to manipulate what they think and how they think about these things and what they know or sorry, what they feel about these things. All of this information, detail, all of it is going to influence their reaction to your story. So, for example, you can have a bird sweetly singing outside the window, and this kind of detail is giving your reader uh, maybe a happy or a peaceful feeling. And that's a detail that we might expect in scene and this this pushes your reader into one understanding of the situation it's going to feel inappropriate if something frightening is happening unless you want that contrast 
to be part of your writing. So uh, you're, maybe you have some detectives discovering a body. I know I, I brought this up in class the other day for one of my sections. Um, if you have something terrifying happening and there's a bird sweetly singing outside the window, maybe your characters are thinking of how much they'd rather be like that, or maybe they're struck by how unnatural it is to have that pretty song going on while there's a body on the floor, or maybe they're thinking about how life goes on even though this person is dead. Any of those things can happen. Um, so your details don't always have to match perfectly what's happening, but you should always be aware of the effect that your writing is going to have on your reader. Right. We're moving on now to dialogue, which is what the characters say and how they say it. And I spell dialogue with a U-E at the end. Uh, it's not always spelled like that. Doesn't matter. Dialogue should do, or should do, no. There are a few things you should think about whenever you're writing dialogue. The first thing is that dialogue ought to sound natural for the character's situation and for the character, uh, for the character's identity. So a character who is trying to sound smarter than they are or who is speaking a foreign language, they, they don't have to sound completely natural as in a, a native speaker of the language or someone who knows all the words that they're trying to use, but it should sound natural for that situation. If you write a character speaking unnaturally, it's going to make your reader pause, and so there ought to be a reason for it. Dialogue should generally advance the plot. It should move things forward, and one of the ways that you can do that pretty easily is by revealing character. The way a character reacts to the things that are happening is going to tell us about them. So the example that I used in class was two detectives standing over a body and just repeating, well, I think she's dead. Yeah, I think she's dead, back and forth to each other. Now, this doesn't really advance the plot at all. Um, your reader knows there's a dead body there. We now know, if these detectives have been repeating it, that they know there's a dead body there. But one thing that this dialogue is doing is revealing who these detectives are. If they're just repeating this back and forth to each other and not really doing any detecting, it's not, uh, it, 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 it's telling us that they are not going to solve the crime, probably. Now, dialogue can also have subtext, uh, which is saying more than it's saying. So there is, going back to the previous point as well, and the example that I used, there's a famous scene from The Wire where two detectives are dealing with an old crime scene, a cold, cold scene, and all they say, all they do the entire scene is swear. While they're doing that, they are looking around the scene and finding things. So that means that we have in our writing, when we write that scene, we describe what they're doing. And that means that each word that they say has a different import. It has subtext. So if we have our detective saying, she's dead, she's dead, she's dead, and they're just standing there, then it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't have subtext other than that these detectives are dumb. But if they're saying, she's dead, she's dead, she's dead, and they're looking around, finding clues, then suddenly every time they say dead, maybe that has a different or new meaning. Uh, a better example, perhaps, of subtext, and one that I did use in class again, is if Bob asks Frank if he wants to go for coffee, that could just mean Bob wants to get coffee with Frank. But if we know that Bob and Frank hooked up a couple nights ago and haven't spoken since then, when Bob asks Frank if he wants to get coffee, 
the subtext there is Bob wants to talk to Frank about what happened the other evening, right? Um, so these are all things that you can think about and can consider when you're writing dialogue. You don't have to think about all of them all the time, but you should think about how they're going to affect your reader, and they should do at least some of these things. All right, I want to talk a little bit about dialogue formatting, or rather show you an example. This next slide is going to be the most common way to format dialogue. So generally, and this, this first paragraph is indented, it's hard to tell because there isn't anything before it, but um, each of these paragraphs are indented here. Uh, you'll see there's a, a comma before Jean said inside the quotation marks, and Jean said those words, that's called a dialogue tag. Typically, Jean said, Charles said, just the word said is important. Um, if you have a character whispering or screaming or shouting, that is going to make your reader pause. Um, your reader ought to know by what is happening and by the gestures, by all of the detail that you're including with your dialogue. They should know how loud your, uh, your speaker is being and what kind of voice they're using. You don't need to use words like screamed or shouted. If Charles's face is red and the tendons are standing out on his neck and his words are echoing off the high ceiling above them, we know, we know that Charles is shouting. You don't need to use the word shouting. Um, you'll also note in here that we don't always need to include a dialogue tag. Uh, so Charles tilted his head and squinted at her. What if the new speaker does something before speaking? I don't need Charles asked, Charles said anything like that because Charles is the only person mentioned in that paragraph. We know that Charles is speaking. All right. In general, the most important thing is that it is clear to your reader who is speaking. If it is not clear who is speaking, your reader is going to get confused. And confusing your reader is usually not a good idea. Uh, if your character who is perceiving these things, if you have a first person narrator in particular who's saying, I walked to the store, I heard some people talking, if they are confused about who is talking, then that's fine. But it isn't your reader who's confused. They understand that your main character, your point of view character is confused. If you're going to actually confuse the reader, though, try to do it sparingly. Uh, your reader is going to feel pushed out of your story if they can't follow along, and you want them to be you're bringing a reader into your dream basically when you write a story and if you push them out of your dream and they remember that they're reading a story instead of experiencing things along with a character that it, they feel disconnected and the impact is not going to be as great that's it for this crash course um we're at under half an hour, and if you listen to it on double speed, then um, around 15 minutes. If you have questions, please send me an email or stop by my office hours. Another option, and a very good option for you, is to find your favorite short story or your favorite novel or uh, favorite piece of fiction writing and see how your favorite author does things. Uh, you can Feel free to mimic their style, mimic their formatting, all of this stuff. And as you try things out, you're going to figure out what works for you. All right, hope this helped. I'll talk to you soon.